We moved to a small kind of private school. You know, immediately, as soon as I came in, I was isolated, psychological and isolation, then moved to more physical. Then it kind of kicked off again and it, you know, it was very hard until I actually stood up to the bullies myself. When a child goes through bullying, they often feel guilty or they feel an element of shame. So that really is the reason I, I do what I do, right? To, to empower young children to overcome difficulty in their lives and to build resilience in young people. Gladiators, welcome back. Today I have a special guest. I always say that, but today is really special because I always talk about the titans of industry and gladiators in business, but this gentleman, he is actual true gladiator and happens to be a gladiator in business as well. So Sebastian Bates, welcome. Thank you for having me. What a great intro. Really? You've got to live up to it now. <laughs> okay, yeah, that'd be good. Mate. Welcome to the arena. <laughs> so um, I was talking to our mutual friend earlier today. Yeah. And I said, I hope Sebastian's got a good story. He goes, oh, wow. <laughs> He's got a story. So where should we start from? Where do we start? Childhood? childhood? Yeah, we can start childhood. So, I mean, my childhood is, you know, I grew up in, grew up in the UK, uh, military family. That was in the Paris and the Commando, so pretty much gladiator as they come. Um, we moved around a lot. Um, and my life was filled with adventure. You know, from a very young age, I was watching him jump out of planes every single weekend, you know, the Hercules, which has now been stopped being used for the, um, you know, I was climbing tanks, doing assault courses, all the sort of stuff that army kind of brats do, right? Moved around a lot. Eventually, you know, my parents came to the realization that the army state school I was in, there was 40 kids in a class. Uh, in one year, the behavior was so bad. We had 13 teachers come and go. So, um, you know, my academics was slipping quite a lot. So we decided to move, you know, at the same time as him moving jobs as well, uh, as the army often do. So we moved to a small kind of private school where there was only 12 kids in the class. And I was only there for two years before I went into the next kind of state school. But in this private school, you know, immediately, as soon as I came in, I was uh, isolated as a very, very different kid to the others, right? These kids were, came from pretty affluent backgrounds. I came from a state school with 40 kids in, in Aldershot in the UK, a very, very different environment. And so I was bullied straight away. So, you know, the bullying, the bullying was pretty hardcore. It started off very psychological and isolation, then moved to more physical, um, you know, and, uh, and, ev and eventually, you know, fast, you know, going forward from that, I, I kind of stood up to the bullies, if you like. And, um, that was a really defining moment. Not uh, how old were you? I was about nine at the time, nine, 10 at the time. The, the, the reason that's defining is not necessarily just in that moment, but it's when you look back and you join up the dots, right? If I kind of fast forward, you know, to where I'm now 33 now, you know, I'd, I built a, a martial arts organization that spans across three continents. We teach 4,000 kids every single week across five countries. Um, you know, I've written books on anti-bullying and character development, all this sort of stuff. And so that really is the reason I, I do what I do, right? To, to empower young children to overcome difficulty in their lives and to build resilience in young people. That's kind of my origin story as a young person. Um, but as I grew up, this sense of stop you there. Yeah, go before because bullying, I got bullied. Yeah, I was uh, thirteen when I went to England, private school. Uh, didn't speak a word of English, right. and I got my ass kicked for two years. Mm. The things that, uh, and also a lot, lot of there was a lot of ignorance with the teachers. Did you? Did you? Was you're considerably younger than me, right? Yeah, but it was an old school. I mean, it was an eighteen hundred school. The um, the, the headmistress was eighty five. The headmaster was ninety. Right, he would fall asleep in classes. They didn't get it. So it was a very old school approach. Did you did you go to teachers or you didn't bother me? I, I used uh, to we, get bullied and I couldn't talk to anyone. Yeah. I just took it. I couldn't come home and tell my mom because she'll beat me up. Yeah, yeah. Right. So yeah. I just couldn't share it with anyone. No, the, well, I mean, the reality is when a child goes through bullying, the first thing that happens is this breakdown in communication, right? And it's there's an element of guilt or shame. I haven't studied it. Right. Well, I mean, when, when, it, when a child goes through bullying, they often feel guilty or they feel an element of shame for actually having gone through it in the first place, especially guys, young boys go through it and they don't want to talk about it because they should be brave. They should be strong. They shouldn't be a victim of bullying. Right. Um, and this is where it's really important that parents have open communication at home before these things happen so they can actually nurture them and mentor them through it. But certainly the school I was in, you know, it was an old school Victorian style building, Famous old man. school teachers. My teacher served in the war. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think these guys were maybe they had just missed it. I don't know, but they were definitely Eight. around. When, they were definitely around when the war was going on. Uh, no, it would have been 15, 16 years ago. Yeah, eighty odd. They would have been in the war. They would have been. Yeah, yeah. And so the, I mean, the 
the situation there was, you know, I was failing academically, so I was punished kind of for not, you know, hitting the standard academically. So and then academically in that school. Improving. Yeah, massively improved. I mean, you it was were, tough. It was a, it was a U turn, right? Like, you know, it was, it was failing academically to then doing really well, not as well as some of the other guys in the class, but certainly better than the, the general kind of average across the country for sure. Um, and so that you know, it's easy to look back and say they that was wrong, that was wrong, but it certainly gave me a, a step up academically. Did you have any friends at that school? Actually? Not really, not at the school. You know, I, I, this is where I found martial arts. So I needed to have some sort of outlet, you know, to, to have some sort of community outside of this school to build my confidence as well. And so my parents found martial arts. And so for, for a good amount of time, I was, you know, I was, did they know you were being good? Did my parents know at the time? Did they find out? They found out eventually. Yeah. My dad even went in full army uniform to address the whole class. You wouldn't get away with that nowadays. Can you imagine that in Dubai? <laughs> you wouldn't be allowed in, would you? So, um, but that didn't work, you know, in, in a lot of ways. It continued, yeah. It continued despite that. Yeah. I think for a short period it worked. And then, then it kind of kicked off again and it, you know, it was very hard until I actually stood up to the bullies myself. And that's the kind of defining moment where you, you build up enough courage to overcome the, the kind of the pain that you're going through, the courage that you feel has to overcome the pain you're going through. Right. And so I think whenever we make any sort of turning point in our life, it's down to what we tolerate as people. So we either tolerate something for so long and then we snap or we come to we come to something very early on and we understand this is our standards for something and we either accept it or we don't and then we make a decision to change um and so for me yeah martial arts was a massive a massive turning point because it was at that point i found a black belt community i call it right so a, an amazing instructor a group of people who were focusing on you know just personal development but within a within a team setting and that's the beauty of martial arts for me it was it was very much a very supportive environment, um, a very big mixture of young people as well, you know, and so everyone was very much encouraging each other to improve. I started competing a lot. I was competing nationally. And so I was winning trophies as a, as a national champion, but then I was going to school the next day and getting bullied and it was kind of incongruent, right? Yeah, how can I a was, national, uh, so similar, I yeah, similar thing. how can a national champion at nine years old yeah, go to school and get bullied, yeah. right? And it's because the lessons I had learned in the dojo hadn't transitioned to the home and school life yet. Mm -hmm. So in my eyes, as I walked into that classroom, I, was just, I still kind of felt like a victim until I reached my tolerance level and made a decision. How long did it take? Two years. Two years till I stood up to that building, yeah. The, there was always a leader. Mm. And this guy was called Ross. Right, and yeah. And things like, can you imagine like in the 80s, you've got this big fat kid with the blonde hair and he's yep. got a bob going on. And he sounds, Fred, he sounds like a bully already. Yeah, Freckles, <laughs> who's just big guy. Yeah. And um, he just kept picking on me. And I just thought, I want to stand up against this guy. So mm -hmm. I said, like, five o'clock tomorrow behind a bike shed. Right. I never went. Oh, really? Okay. Then I had a feeling, a gut feeling, that he also never went. Right? So next day, he's avoiding me. And I started getting cocky. Right. Right. So I went, where were you then? No. <laughs> and he was like, no, where were you? So I'm making excuses, right? I was like, yeah, okay. And I started really showing off. And then he got wound up, said, right, lunchtime. Mm. Oh, really? So you have to play table tennis. He comes in with his 10 of his mates. Oh, dear. And uh, during lunch break, we'd roll, we smashed the table tennis table, broke in half. And I gave it some, you know. And, you know, when people kick in, they were shouting, scrap, scrap, they yeah, were yeah. kicking in. And, and um, the bell went. So it all finished. And I don't know how I'd done because we were just rolling around, punching each other and stuff. And I went to class and my class was Latin. Can you believe it? I'm oh, really? Latin yeah, yeah. with glasses on. <laughs> Shaking, I looked and I had my my knuckles were bleeding. My the last thing you wanted to do is a Latin class at that stage. My clothes is ripped, and and then it sinks in. What's happened? And I got the shakes. Mm. I don't know if that's. Mm -hmm. And um, but I got so much respect from the guy after that. Did you, you turn out to be best friends afterwards? Never, never. It's often the way, isn't it? You know, yeah, always have a little scrap. He and was, best mate. No, no, no. Because his principles were wrong, isn't it? Right. So. um but he, he showed me respect. But last day, I got my uh, revenge on all of them. Right. And I kicked the hell out of every one of them, well, one by one. Didn't make me feel any better. Though. No. Didn't honestly make me feel any better. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's a power void, isn't it? Someone's taken power from you when they put you through something like bullying. Yes. And you're trying to fill that void. And you think the way to fill that void is by, you know, getting them back revenge. Yeah. It's kind of an empty victory, right? right? So much anger inside me. Mm. So much pain inside me. Yeah. Do you think going through bullying at a young age has served you in life? Um, 
who gave me a miserable two years of my life, that's yeah. for sure. Uh, I never experienced bullying in Iran because I was one of many. Yeah. When I came here, I stood out. Yeah. It's so, off, on the, off on the way. Yeah. I was different and I couldn't speak English. So. But I got bullying from my teachers. Really? My uh, PE teacher used to call me Black Cherry. Can you believe it? Wow. My uh, science teacher, I was a wog. Wow. I didn't know what wog was. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And these were the names he used to call me. Whereabouts in the UK was this? Uh, Cheshire, Wilmsley. Right. Yeah. yeah. But it was a 1800 so so school. And, yeah. Um, one day, you know, the psychological torture was worse because, like, they used to, I used to get in a queue for biscuits and orange juice in the afternoon. I don't know if you had that. Yeah, 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 that, yeah. Right. And there'd be there maybe one person in front of me, and then he'll say to the person behind me, go in front of me. And within five minutes, I was back of the queue. Yeah. You know, like that torment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No matter when I, stuff like that. Yeah, no matter you can't when prove I, to a teacher. It's goes, it goes, it goes they, They're messing with you all the time. And there was three schoolyards. And then when the break came, the first one to the schoolyard was a captain. I don't know if you had that school. And then they could pick the teams. Right. Right. So I will go to the yards and I'll stand and nobody will pick me. Yeah. Break after break after break. So what happens? Well, I thought, you know what? I'm not going to be defeated. So I'll be the first. I'll be the captain. So I'll turn up. I'll be the first. Nobody will come on my pitch. Mm. So I was there alone on this pitch. Yeah, yeah. Not, no team to pick. So it's an isolation, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And I felt best. Now, to answer your question, I'm at my best when I'm on my own. Yeah. I don't like crowds. I'm, mm. I'm an introvert. This, what I do now is, is hard work yeah, because I have to do it if I've got to get a message out. Yeah. But deep down inside, I love my, my own space. Yeah. My own silence, my own solitude. I don't know if the same with you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I spend a lot of time alone, you know, and I enjoy my own presence, my own company, right? I, I, I walk for two or three hours on my own every day. You know, that's where I do, do my most creative thinking is on my walks, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to that. How, yeah. the, how the hell do you fit it all in? <laughs> so after school, uh, 9 to 11, 12, yep. what, what happened there? Um, left, so you left I, that school. Eventually left that school, started at a, uh, a, a secondary school, kind of normal secondary school. It's a good school. Um, you know, did really well there. Uh, eventually, at sort of 16, I was in the Royal Marines Reserves. So I was still in school well, during sixth form. But at the weekends and on the Wednesdays, I would, you know, be training with the Royal Marines. All of my friends were suddenly in their 30s. So I pretty much very quickly, from a maturity point of view, outgrew all of my friends at school. You know, during the lunch break. <laughs> Siblings. I had, yeah, three siblings, yeah. Oh, wow. So it's yeah. quite a large Four of us, yeah. And you're the oldest, youngest, middle? So I'm, I'm number two. Elder okay. sister, me, mm -hmm. uh, younger sister, then younger brother. I see. And then so the discipline side comes from your dad? Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. He was, he was very, like, disciplined with us. You know, good still example. He's still with us, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah, very, very much so. Yeah, he's, he's a big part of what we do from the charity side, which I'll, I'll go into later. But, um, but no, a good example of how disciplined he was, you know, I... One of the reasons I didn't like football when I was younger was because of the way in which we finished a football game, right? We would finish football, go home. It doesn't matter if it was snowing, if it was raining. I'd be outside polishing the boots until they were perfect before I was allowed back in the house. And at sort of, you know, eight, nine years old, it's the last thing you want to do. But it certainly taught discipline. Like his attention to detail was, was very, very high. You know, he would go away for six months at a time on, on tour or whatever it was in the army. Um, but when he was there, he was very present. And so a lot of the time when I'm, you know, working with parents now, you know, it's, they feel this element of guilt. They're not around all the time. Um, but, you know, I, I always say to them, the kids, they want your time. They want your presence. They want 30 minutes of you actually caring and really being with them. Then you spending all day, you know, on your phone or watching Netflix. Right. So, so for him, you know, he was very, very present when he was around. He took us on adventures. That was a big part of what we did. Was he a huggy kind of person? Not really. Person? Not really. I mean, makes you a little bit distant, right? Yeah, but he, it, wasn't, it wasn't like he was anti that, you know, it's still today, you know. If I want to hug him, I'll hug him, but it's, you Does know. Does he hug you back? That's the question. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we one of these, all right, son. <laughs> no, yeah. Shake the hand. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've got a great relationship. And, um, you know, like I said, I've been on many adventures with him. So, you know, I remember when I was 17, we, we flew all of our, we flew our mountain bikes to Africa. We cycled across the Sahara Desert through Marrakesh over the Atlas Mountains, you know, 300 to 500 miles. Just one example of one of the adventures he took. The whole family's active or just you? Whole family's active, yeah. Sister was in the GB team for gymnastics. Brother was heavily into football. Uh, older sister was a gymnastics coach. So the whole family just super sporty and active. Just a way of life. You know what I mean? Just always active, always doing stuff, always very, very competitive. It's very rare that we all get together and the meal doesn't end in some sort of 
physical challenge. It's like arm wrestling or handstand press up competition or whatever it is. There's always some element of challenge going on in the Bates house. It's a fun, a fun family. <laughs> yeah, it, de it definitely is. And I, I think that's, you know, that competitive spirit has is, is served us all individually very well. And they're all, all over the world or England and Dubai? Yeah. So um, my sister's in the UK with her husband and two kids. My younger sister's just moved to Dubai with her fiance. They've started a business here. My younger brother is in Denmark. He started a business over there. Um, and I'm here with my wife and, and two kids. So we're, we're kind of spread out quite a bit. A lot of people have their own businesses in their family, right? But yeah, I mean, having, having a father who's been in the army, yeah, had the systems put in place for him, and yeah. So what what made you an entrepreneur? Of you? So this is where it gets kind of interesting. Um, both my parents, government jobs, dad, army, mum, NHS. Um, I finished school at eighteen, finished sixth form. All of my friends went to Afghanistan in the Royal Marines. I decided to go to uni in Denmark because it was free for anyone in the EU. So I went to study architecture there. About a year into the door. worst places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. I'm half Danish. Poor you. So. Poor you. <laughs> it was difficult. So it actually did get difficult. So, I mean, that's one of the reasons I left. So about a year into it, you know, I was, I was studying every day. My expectation of uni in Denmark was what I thought uni was going to be like in England. You know, freshers year, loads of socializing, good fun. It was the opposite. You know, I studied from eight till five. And then I was to pay, you know, for rent and food. I was washing dishes in a steakhouse. From sort of eight pm to as much as two am. No, it was awful. It, you know, it, it just, just there was no fun involved for me, and so I just wanted adventure. You know, and I remember, I remember having this conversation with the uni professor, and she said, "Look, and you know, I noticed you haven't been coming for the last week. What's going on?" I said, "I'm just feeling a bit demotivated. You know, I'm washing dishes every night. I've got one pair of shoes. So when I come into school the next day, I've got wet shoes. I want all these kind of Danish people around me have, have loans and grants and all that sort of stuff, and I'm working my ass off." And I wasn't enjoying myself. And she said, look, well, in 40 years, you can be here, you'll be doing this, you can have this job and so on. And while that would be inspiring to a lot of people, for me, I was just like, Not for me, it's nice. yeah, I went home and that night I bought a one-way ticket to India. And this is where the adventure begins. So I went home, spoke to Lexic, were you supposed to call Italy and you just booked India by mistake? <laughs> like, do you know, I'd never been to India. And I was like, this, you know, from the research I've done that evening, India looked like the biggest adventure of all the places I could have Tell imagine. me about it. Yeah. You know, but an assault on the senses in every regard. And so. You're 18. You're 18. I was 19 then. Yeah. 19, just turned 19, I believe. And so I, I, I flew to India a couple of weeks later uh, with a friend of mine from the UK. We had no money. And so for a long time, you know. But you, you go far with very little money. It's amazing what you can do. And it's amazing how when you're forced to be creative, just how creative you can be financially as well were you getting so, any pressure from parents saying what the hell are you doing get back yeah i mean my parents you know their 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 son who was destined to be an architect they had told all their friends was going to be an architect was now on a you know never-ending gap year in india uh, with no <laughs> with no real you know time he was going to come home so when what i realized in india was i could be creative and find ways to make money um by solving problems so i would do things like go to hotels and say look if I can bring you five tourists and I can fill up five rooms, can you let me stay for a few days, free accommodation, free food? And, you know, I go to the docks or I go to the bus stop and I come back with five tourists, boom, that would take me a few hours to do. I would do that wherever I went. You know, I went to Thailand and I rented out four or five bungalows for full moon parties and then went to the, the harbour or the ports and had, you know, fill them up with tourists and charge 20% on top. And, you know, by that point, I was able to easily seek out these opportunities, right? And so for me, I had never met an entrepreneur. I was someone at the post office, but that's more like a sole trader, right? You ever told you were a good salesman? Yeah, I think so. I think it's people, some people are naturally good at articulating a solution to a problem. And for me, that's what sales is, right? It's like, There's can you- opportunity everywhere. Yeah, exactly. You know, you're looking, you're looking around and you're, you're, you're putting, it's like a Rubik's cube. You know, you're kind of you're putting things together to make things work. And then you're presenting it in a way that looks favorable. And that's, that's ultimately what entrepreneurship is, right? It's solving problems for people and presenting it in the right way. And I think um, that's what traveling taught me. So I traveled for a good year, eventually came back to the UK. Um, and I didn't want to just get a normal job. I wanted to do something physical. So I studied to be a PT for six weeks. My first gig as a personal trainer was, um, was taking over a Thai boxing club. So I took over this inner city Thai boxing club. And I had about 15 
young men in there and it was testosterone filled you know they just they just went there to let off steam you know there was they were coming with black eyes some of them were su suffering with kind of substance abuse drugs alcohol they were kicked out by their parents some of them were sleeping rough on the street unhealthy relationships you name it these guys are going through it broken biscuits exactly yeah yeah and so and so you know when i when i took over the the class it was like they were coming out of fight every week and then the work i was doing with them i started to see massive changes within 12 months you know they weren't just kicking and their shoes off when they came in same age you were still i was young i was 20, 20 i was just 20 at this stage yeah so just 20 and they were sort of 16 17. Okay. um and there i was the kind of only positive male role model maybe they had ever had in their lives telling them to call each other sir telling them to park their shoes off properly bow before the end of the dojo all this sort of Did stuff. they challenge you some of them yeah of course yeah yeah we had a lot you know there were lots of kind of challenges and you know i think the the physical training challenges physically the yeah I, was, I, would, I would be sparring with them a lot or training yeah. with them i had to gain their respect all the time so i would join in the classes physically yeah. and just make sure i was always one step yeah, ahead win it yeah always one step ahead whatever i would ask them to do i would do as well right so I think I, I earned their respect that way. And then they were, you know, they were, they wanted to kind of follow in my footsteps and live a more healthy life. And so a year later we had, you know, 12 national champions from that small group of 15 to 20 boys. And it was remarkable the change that martial arts had on their lives. It was really a, you know, a full 180, but more so with their character. The martial arts didn't really matter, right? They were already quite tough. They could already handle themselves. Mm -hmm. This was more about their conduct giving them a moral compass, teaching them how to live their life as a young man, giving them that kind of role model and path. And I came to the realization. The thing is, this doesn't come through kickboxing. It doesn't come through Muay Thai, does it? You must yeah. have thrown Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, exactly, yeah. So, so Muay Thai is in. You threw other disciplines into me. I mean, Muay Thai is very disciplined, but it's also very relaxed and very playful. Right. Um, my background's in very traditional styles like Taekwondo. And so I kind of brought them together to mm -hmm. create this environment whereby it was very practical with the martial arts side and the self-defense side and very physical, just like Muay Thai, but it had this very structured, clear moral compass from Taekwondo. Yeah. And so they really benefited from that. And I think, I, you know, I realized to myself, if I just work with them at a younger age, if I could work with those guys when they were four or five, I could plant the seeds of a black belt character so they wouldn't need to go through all the stuff they went through. So by the time they were 18, they could be on a completely different path. And so that's what I did. I, I started working with um, young students. I opened up a, my, my first kind of kids club uh, in a small village called Road. You're still a kid. Yeah. yeah. And I was, I was 20. Yeah, yeah. You're still a kid yourself. Yeah. 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 I, also, I often think about that. You know, I'm, I'm kind of just getting started. And the, um, you know, the, 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 the club there, we had 20 kids sign up out of 100 in the whole school. Um, it, what's amazing is I, we still teach some of those kids now. Some of them, you know, 12 years later, Grow up. they're instructors with us. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's amazing to think that the kind of legacy that little club has had, um, you know, it's amazing. And so, you know, it very quickly grew in that small, small club of 20 kids in that one class. So three or 400 kids across the Southwest of England in schools. And, um, you know, at, at the time I was pursuing extreme sports. So there's a whole other side to me in my twenties, which was this whole adventure side, right? And I, I wanted to live a, an adventurous life. I was terrified of having a boring life, doing the same thing. Probably the same thing that made me repel uni and uh, the concept from the professor of in 40 years, you can do this. What made you think in your life of having an adventurous life? I think it's the seeds planted in a young age, right? When you're, when you're you know, I, I kind of, look, I guess my dad jumping out of planes every weekend probably had an influence. Like watching him doing that. You actually physically watched him do that. Yeah, he was, he was a para. So we would just watch him, you know, which one is he? And there's 200 guys jumping out of planes, right? So you know, I, I look back at that. I look back at how adventure and, you know, opportunities that were encouraged in my life. And I think that just kind of, it's nurturing nature. Was your dad telling you he's proud of you? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I've, got a, I've got a great relationship with him, um, even to today. Um, and so that old. How old? he's 64, 63, 64. Yeah. So, so, you know, this, this element of adventure was always apparent in my life. And so I decided to start skydiving. Um, I very quickly got to a point of skydiving where I felt like I could do more. So I got into wingsuit skydiving, jumping with a wingsuit out of the plane. Mean it. And then I, then I decided to get into space jumping. And so Did you have a girlfriend at the time. Not when I was skydiving. Serious relationship. Not when I was not, not, not when I started. 
Um, my my wife was the next long term relationship I had after I started. That that time of skydiving and base jumping, I was pretty much on my own up until I. You can't be in a serious relationship if you're dicing with death every weekend, right? No, no, and and this is this is where the turning point kind of happened with me. Um, that you know what what I found was I was, you know, I, I would I would I wouldn't leave the house without a parachute in the boot of my car. You know, I would I would always. At any point, I could be driving to a you know a place to skydive or to base jump. You know, I'd, I'd spend months at a time in Italy in the mountains, wingsuit jumping off cliffs. Uh, you know, I was jumping in in Idaho in America, in Switzerland, all over the place. And so I I did about five hundred wingsuit base jumps and skydives around the world in the space of about eighteen months. And so most of my friends were it's costing you, right? Because you pay no profit in this. No, 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 no. Yeah, no, no. traveling is cost. You could book the flights, get the car. Yeah, I mean, my, my business at the time was doing well. You know, three or four hundred kids in the in the organization. Enough enough for me to outsource a lot of the technical delivery, and then have a little bit left over to to fund some adventure. So it's just quite. We could go on forever. Yep. <laughs> um, you going all over Europe, uh, Italy, America, and all this. Planning? Did you actually plan anything, or just oh, this this is, looks interesting? Cliff, I just jump off. The oh, lo loads of planning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So planning so, is important, isn't it? Otherwise, so much due diligence. You got to look at wind direction. You got to look at turbulence. You got to pack your parachute within a millimeter. You, the attention to detail needs to be so high. And you used to pack your own parachute. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. So if you're if you're if you're base you jumping, you pack your parachute. Uh, I went on a base jumping course in uh, Twin Falls in Idaho, uh, and that's where I learned actually. And we did something like a hundred jumps in ten days. It was pretty. Pretty hardcore. I think we slept about three or four hours every night to do it. And it was jumping in the middle of the night, jumping in the day, and just constantly jumping just to build that you know, the, the repetition. We never had a fear for heights. Yeah, as much as any other normal human, you know. But I, but I always say this to everyone you can get used to anything. You can get used to, if you're terrified of public speaking, you take small steps. Before you know it, you can get used to it, right? If you're terrified of doing a Facebook Live, you just do small steps. Before you know it, you're doing it. If you're terrified of jumping off a cliff with a wingsuit with four of your mates after a six hour hike, you don't just start doing that. You, you do, you get good at skydiving and then you get good at wingsuiting and then you do a normal base jump and then you slowly build up. Um, but I got to the point where I, I essentially was really pushing it way too far. Um, and base jumping is one of the most dangerous sports, if not the most dangerous sport um, on the planet. You know, it's, it's arguably got a higher death rate than some of the, you know, the, the elite special forces out there, right? And so you're, you're part of this then, this elite group of extreme sports athletes where there's an incredible camaraderie. But the downside of all these incredible things you experience is you see a lot of death. You see a lot of your friends go. You did see that, you witnessed. Yeah, and so I had 15 friends die in one year. So 15 good friends. And um, that pretty much happened at the same time I had one of my accidents. So I had an accident in Switzerland. It was my seventh jump of the day. And I, I did a jump, normal jump, uh, in a wingsuit, jumped off, went along the side of the cliff, found my, the waterfall as my reference point, flanked right, slowed down my canopy. Um, I pulled a little bit lower than I should have. Tree. Sorry? Hit a tree. Not hit a tree, no. The, the canopy came out. <clears throat> the canopy came out, but I was heading towards power lines. I was about, I was about 100 foot off the ground at this point, and I needed to make an emergency turning to avoid the power lines. When I went to unzip my left zipper on the wingsuit because you're kind of in a straight jacket the left zipper was jammed you think you're flying at this time and you try to unzip your suit yeah I'm, so i'm under canopy at this time so i'm under canopy the parachute's out so that's good news right so now i'm trying to unzip the left suit, the left wing i can't do that can you see any cables but you can see the power lines right? you can see i can see the power lines in front of me and i know the direction i'm going and i know i need to change the direction of the canopy uh, i managed to free the right arm but now instead of steering the canopy properly i've got to use just my right arm to pull the parachute and basically pull it down so as I pull the parachute, what happens was the, the canopy turned, but then it just suddenly collapsed. So the, the force of the turn collapsed the whole canopy. Yeah. And I dropped 50 foot. And so it was kind of a, a you know, five, five floors, if you like. It's kind of a miracle I survived. My head hit the floor so hard, I bounced straight back up. Um, I didn't break my spine and my neck. You had a helmet on. Had a helmet on. Um, but I broke everything from my waist down. Both legs, you know, both feet, both ankles. The tendons blew off my left foot. The heel bone kind of exploded on impact and short shards of bone up the leg. Uh, it took me three hours to be found and taken to a hospital. You were in pain or no pain? Yeah, a lot of pain. Yeah, they, they could. Some French climbers heard me. <laughs> so I was, in, I was in a decent amount of pain. And three hours. Yeah, no more. Sometimes you go unconscious, you know, 
Yeah, no, I, I stayed so, conscious throughout, so. which is good. If I, I think if I stayed, if I was unconscious, you could have died. Yeah, I mean, if it got too dark and, you know, yeah. you know, was, but, you know, fortunately, I stayed alive, stayed conscious, got found, and I was taken to a hospital where I could get morphine. Um, at the hospital, they, they pretty much said to me, I'll never walk again. So in Switzerland, they looked at the x-rays and they were like, they're just so blurry. There's so much damage here. How do we break it to him? And, you know, this is where my, my dad flew into Switzerland and picked up my car. We did an 18 hour road trip home while I was injecting blood thinner and morphine into my legs the whole way home. Dropped me off at the hospital. He then goes to the, goes home to look after 30 of our family who are staying over because my sister's getting married the next day. <laughs> so she's, she, yeah, she's getting married. Um, I'm in hospital, have surgery. Uh, the doctor then after surgery says, I'm never going to walk again as well. Um, but what I managed to do is escape the hospital and turn up at the church and, um, what, what, a wheelchair? Had two crutches. So I managed to manage to get two crutches, get into my friend's car. I said, I was going to be there at the church. And I was, um, I had to then leave quite quickly afterwards to go back to the hospital. Um, but you know, I didn't want to let the family down. And so essentially what, what kind of happened from that point was two years of rehabilitation. Uh, jiu jitsu played a big part of that actually, you know, before we spoke about jiu jitsu, right? And, and so, you know, two years of learning to walk again. I had to move back home with my parents. Um, my wife now was my girlfriend at the time. I'd only met her six weeks before that, maybe four to six weeks before that. So she was in a relationship with a guy, or well, she was dating a guy who was a professional fighter, you know, wingsuit base jumper, the peak of his condition. Oh, no, no, four no. weeks later, he's never going to walk again. So I didn't want to see her. You know, I said to her, you know, don't come and see me because the worst thing I think in a relationship is to, to base it on one person saving the other. Yeah, and ruin her life. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, I, I, could, I could push her away as much as I could, but it got to the point where she just wasn't having it. You know, she wanted to see me. And so, you know, she was kind of fundamental to that rehabilitation, especially from the mental side. You paid the price ever since. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I should get to marry her. Oh, God, go on then. <laughs> So I've been trying to repay that debt. So, yeah, exactly. no, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so the rehabilitation took a long time. Um, started off first six months. I couldn't feel my feet. Business continued. Business continued. But for the first six months, I had some cover. Um, I couldn't feel my feet because the nerve damage was so bad. So when I touched them, they didn't feel like mine. Uh, eventually, I got some feeling back in the feet. And then I really worked on the, with the physios on bringing that back. Um, for about a year after, I taught on crutches. So I taught martial arts on crutches for a year to try and keep the business alive. Um, it's amazing how, you know, a lot of the parents would open up doors for me as their, their martial arts would come in. I just sit down and teach the whole class sitting down and now and again, hobbling over and correcting a bit of technique and then sitting back down again. And, um, and then, yeah, li literally two years into it, I, I had almost made a full recovery. I was walking, but with a bit of a limp. And then I was referred to the pain clinic. And the pain clinic is like the Alamo, the last Alamo of rehab. It's where they send you where they basically want to teach no, you. No there's no hope. Get used to wheelchairs. Get, get used, used to pain. pain. Get used to living in pain for the rest of your life. Like I 22. 20, was I then? I was 24 when the accident happened. So I would have been about 26. Okay. And um, not that long. no, 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 no. Yeah. Eight, well, yeah, eight years ago. Yeah. So I, so I, at that point, I, you know, I said, I was in the, uh, in the pain clinic and they, they basically turned around and said, look, we're going to teach you how to live with pain for the rest of your life. This is the reality. And so at 26, with this obsession with not living a boring life, I was in a pain clinic with arthritis, told I had to limit all of my activity for the rest of my life. You still have one? Yeah. I've got ways of dealing with it now, which work very well. But, but yeah, so, so essentially, I had got my body up to a point where I was, I'd made a pretty much a full recovery in terms of I could use my legs, but I couldn't walk more than a couple of kilometers. And so I decided, look, if I, if I was going to, at that point, you weren't even thinking about jumping off planes. No, that's, that's all I was thinking street. about. That's Leading all I was thinking about. You. Yeah. 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 So people would say, you're never going to walk again. And I would say, I'm going to jump again. And so at, at 26 years old, I, I found myself on the edge of an exit point and ready to jump again. And I did do a couple of jumps, um, in Italy, some incredible jumps where there were short hikes. Um, a beautiful jump with a water landing if I needed the to have a quick out. You jumped. Yeah. What was that feeling? Because the last time was when you had an accident. 
Yeah, uh, apprehension, but attention. Were you worried a little bit? Was or no, just yeah, no. There, there was. You know, the the problem was I spent two years not being able to to walk in a so much pain watching fifteen of my friends die while I was stuck at home. You know, so it's it's not only the the physical you can't do this; it's the mental. Everyone around you's dying. Who's trying to do this? Um, but at that point, I you know I, I got to the I got to the stage where there was no hope in my normal life. Right? You're never you're never gonna have a normal life. You're gonna live with pain the rest of your life. So I did nothing really to lose. Just lose. And so I got to the stage where I I wanted to start jumping again. I did a few jumps, and there was one really sketchy jump in in Sweden that I was going to do. It was really snowy, really icy, and we walked back down. And I think that if if I didn't walk back down, that probably would have been the last jump I did. Um. And very shortly after that, I was in the same hospital, the exact same hospital, on the exact same date, three years before when I had the accident in, in the UK, where I had the surgery. Okay. And at exactly midnight, my daughter was born. No. And so there I am holding this tiny little human being. And for the first time in my life, I realized that she was completely vulnerable and dependable on me. If I carried on doing what I was doing, she wouldn't have a dad. She wouldn't have a dad to raise her, right? And so, you know, I realized you, you pushed the bar so much. Why? It's just my character. Even now. Yeah, even now, hundred percent. Yeah, maybe worse now. <laughs> I don't know. In many ways, I think that I think that I I find balance and moderation in my life, but I also leverage the extremes in my life. It's kind of like a double-edged sword. You know, I've, I've got to be very aware. It's caused lots of fights at home. Oh, she just likes that. My she my wife? It. Yeah. No, I think she. I think she, knows she brings it. out the best in me. You know, she's she's great. She's great at finding that balance with me. Um, but she, you know, I, I get very stuck into things and go all out, two hundred percent. Is she as disciplined as you are? Does she do exercise? Yeah, well? she's 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 training every single day. We live a very healthy life. You know, so so it's it's amazing to have that level of support. We're we're very we're two very different people, but our sense of humor is very similar. Um, we've got a fantastic relationship. I'm very lucky there, really. Um, yeah, and, and actually, are you lucky? Because you only get what you tolerate in life. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's like if she didn't, if she wanted to have a different relationship, she would have gone and got that, and so would I. We were, we were two separate, happy, single people who just kind of found each other. So, you know, I think luck is an element to play in lots of things in life. But I also think so it is your tolerance levels and, and what you actually seek and where you place your value. Right? That's kind of another story, though. But um, you read books. Yeah, lots of books. Yeah, yeah. What kind of books do you read? I used to read a lot of um, autobiographies. I used to find that fascinating. I used to find the, you know, the, the the idea that someone's lived a whole life and they can tell these stories through a book, and you can kind of join on that journey, uh, join them on that journey. Really, really fascinating. So, whose life do you find most fascinating? Top two, three, whatever. Top two to three people. Elon Musk's book is quite good. I think that was actually a biography, not an autobiography, but I really enjoyed that. I like entrepreneur books, you know, entrepreneur life stories, because there's elements of business I can learn from as well. Of Howard Hughes. Yes, the guy who created um, the the airline, the, airline. Wood, the airline, the the film um, Aviator. Yes, yeah. with Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah, he's my hero. Great book as well. He was brought up around the um, his father. He, his father invented a drill that went to a certain depth, and then he could mm. go past. And then instead of selling these drill heads, they were renting it to all the oil companies. Yeah, it was a multi-millionaire. But I think. He inherited his dad died young at about 16. Right. And then kicked out all his family, ran the company at 17, 18. Wow. And then he went to Hollywood, changed Hollywood, went to Vegas. Vegas is today what it is because of that. Yeah. Satellites in the sky right now were, were um, him. Wow. Incredible guy. What a person. Yeah. And yeah. then for like 30 years, nobody took a photo of him. Yeah. He disappeared in his own little. Just had enough. I, don't think I, I bet a lot of people feel like that now. It can't happen now. It's social media. It's yeah, it can't happen now. <laughs> the phone's everywhere. So. Aparazzi, yeah. Amazing. Guy. Wow. And he was good looking. Yeah. His mate was Cary Grant, six foot three. The two of them used to go about town and really? have fun. Yeah. yeah. All. Interesting life. Discipline. But I mean, this, this is it. And then there's, you know, there's, there's stories of athletes and, you know, that, that I find fascinating. Um, so stories of other people have kind of driven me to then seek more of my own life, I think. Right now, how's your health? How's your knees? How are your legs? Can you kick? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so this is the remarkable thing, really. Um, you know, I, I was I was lucky to find a great trainer here in Dubai in the last year, especially who, you know, just, just kind of helped me rebuild my body. And so, this is where walking comes in. So, before this trainer, what was your health like? 
My health was good. I was I was competing in jiu-jitsu at a national level. Really? Yeah. Okay, so um, you weren't tentative. You weren't careful. You were no, not at all. I was, you know, I was tra- lifting weights five times a week, training jiu-jitsu all the time, doing a lot of boxing. Um, but you have a jiu-jitsu belt or something? Are you yeah, I got I got to blue belt in jiu-jitsu. Um, I wasn't. I was never really seeking belts. You know, I studied jiu-jitsu for about four, maybe five years. And you was, black belt in taekwondo, I guess. Yeah, third down in taekwondo and and kickboxing, and then I was fighting professionally in Thailand for Thai boxing. And can you do the splits now? Probably not now. No. <laughs> <laughs> I've always been impressed by men who can do splits, right? <laughs> You're going to challenge you to this. We're, we're no, just, no, we're no, just splits no, no challenging. No, no, no. <laughs> My, the fact that I'm sitting is a bonus. Okay. You have to watch but, me stand. <laughs> that's, that's an experience. <laughs> it's about five minutes. Yeah. But no, so, so yeah. So for me, it, dealing with arthritis became a kind of daily ritual where I, I understood that before, up, to, up until a year ago, I couldn't walk more than an hour or an hour and a half without aching the next day and limping the next day, right? So the arthritis would just be so bad. And the only way around- Arthritis all over or in certain- No, just in my ankles. Yeah, where they had to reattach the tendons and fix the heel and all this sort of stuff with surgery. So the the real pain of arthritis is that your body is in pain and it's telling you all the time to stop doing what you're doing. When really what the body needs is movement. The joint is actually seeking movement, right? So if anyone who's going through arthritis, one of the I biggest, have, I have one. yeah, one of the biggest challenges and misconceptions is that you need to rest, right? You need to rest the joint. You need to do the opposite. You need to move the joint, not overuse it, but you actually need to lean into the pain, get very, very good at recovery, become an expert in recovery, but also get used to being in pain and kind of just pushing that all the time. I would say the first 20 minutes of every day, I'm in pain with arthritis, right? So I wake up in the morning. You know, I walk down the stairs and it hurts. As soon as, I, as soon as I wake up, the first thing that I experience is pain every single day. Me too. And so the only way you can overcome that is through discipline, right? And so you often have a voice in your head saying, you hurt, your feet are hurting, get back in um, bed. Exactly. Painkillers, ice, whatever it is. You know, and I, I always say to myself, I'll have that conversation outside. I'll stick my trainers on. And if I want to have that conversation with myself, I will, but I'll do it outside. Even in this heat. You Even still- in this heat, yeah. So this morning I was up at 5 a.m. Um, you know, like I said, I couldn't walk for more than an hour before. Now I walk about two or three hours every morning. You know, and that's where what I do. do you live if you don't mind me? Jebel Ali area. Okay, and where so it's around Jebel Ali? All, all around, yeah. I mean, I've, I've got two dogs. Uh, one's a, one's a um, rescue dog. One's a Cocker Spaniel from England. So I get up early to walk these guys. Two hours you walk these guys? I do two hours with them. And, you know, from five to seven. Um, and we walk all over Dubai, you know, through the desert. We go to so you get in the car. I've walked to labor camps with them and gone for coffees with the workers. And so you like, get in the car and you go. Somewhere. No, 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 no. I, I just walk from where I am. From from where I live, there are so many little places you can go, and I've explored a lot of them. <laughs> You'll be surprised. <laughs> and then you come home and the kids are awake suddenly. Wife's up. Yeah, so, that, so I come home and then I, you know, while well, the kids are having breakfast, I then I then go on the the treadmill, which I put in the living room like a walking machine, stick a weighted vest on, and then I walk for another hour. Three hours a day. Yeah, two hour dog walk and then one hour with a weighted vest. No, you must be so much fun to live with. <laughs> and then when you when you when you walk around those two hours, do you have something in your ear? Listen to yeah, I listen music. to music. No, I used to, I used to I used Everything to consume. I like to just be on my own. Well, I go through different phases, I guess. I mean, I, I used to want to consume and, and learn all the time when I was walking, right? Podcasts, audiobooks. And then I got to the stage where I just cre- I just create. So now when I'm walking, I'm, I'm writing down ideas. I'm writing down content ideas. I'm writing down thoughts I've got. I'm kind of journaling. Um, I'm doing a lot, of the, a lot of my work on my walks as well. So for a lot of people, they'll, they'll then go back to the office. They'll go to the gym, they'll go to the office, and they'll, you know, then they'll do their work. I do that on the move. So most of my work is from WhatsApp or it's spreadsheets on my phone or whatever it is. Um, so you don't like meditation or meditative state. You, you are doing things when you're walking. Yeah, and I'm you're like, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes I, you know, I put the phone away and I just you know, spend 10, 20 minutes just, just doing nothing, just in my own thoughts, right? But a lot of the time I, I use that. So I'm doing it for such a long time. To be productive in the day, I use that time productively. And so I go through this, this kind of process of, finishing most of my work before 7 a.m., right? By the time it's 8 a.m., I've walked for three hours. I've burned 700 calories. And then I normally go, um, go and train for 60 minutes at the gym. Uh, You're do a, mad. You're <laughs> mad. Yeah. So I do a good... Can you run? Can you run? I can run, yeah, but I don't, I don't really like to. I think it just aggravates the joints more. Mm-hmm. Um, so walking for me is low intensity enough to keep me lean and to keep my knee up, right? So my activity throughout the day is high. 
without taking my energy away from the weightlifting sessions I do. So you lift quite science. hard. The whole thing is the science, right? You've studied this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so literally my, my routine on a, on a normal, like this week, for instance, yeah, every day. Um, at the moment, I'm on a bit, a bit, a bit of a deficit. So I'm trying to cut back on, on um, body fat. And, and basically, I stay between 10 and 12% body fat. And I get tested every single month to hold me accountable. And if I go 1% above, then I go down to like 9 10%. And I make sure that I stay within that. So I eat the same food every single day, apart from the evenings where I mix it up, but it's always veg and lean meat or something. No butter. Um, no butter. Very little butter. You don't drink, ever, you don't smoke. If I drink alcohol, I try and stick to, you know, three, three or four glasses at the weekend. Or, you know, if it's a special occasion coming up, then I'll do more, but it's rare. I try not to. A lot of the time I can't really justify a hangover. All my decisions the next day are influence. And it's not just, you know, the calories you consume when you're drinking. It's the next day where you've, you've got a victim mindset. You feel sorry for yourself. So you're just a bit useless, aren't you? Not just be such a great dad, you know. Yeah, exactly. Dad. You're useless in every aspect of your life when you're hungover normally. Like your work productivity goes down. You're not a great dad, all this sort of stuff, right? And, and so I, I, I found myself waking up, you know, the next day with a hangover and just beasting myself. You know, I, I trained so hard to try and correct what I'd done. And it's not really a healthy way of living. So I just cut back on that entirely. So a normal, a normal week for me is three, you know, three hours, two hours walking in the morning, followed by one hour on the, um, on, uh, on the treadmill with, with, a, with a weighted vest. And I do an hour of weightlifting in the afternoon. Then the evening, I do like 30 to 45 minutes on a salt bike. And then in the gym, do you have a personal trainer or do you do by yourself? Yeah, I've got, a, I've got a personal trainer, yeah. Same guy we're talking Same about. Same guy who I've worked with for like a year. And, and the, the great thing about that every is- Every day, every day? With four them? times a week. And the, I mean, for you, I think when, you're, when you start to lift quite heavy as well, Technique and form is everything. And, you know, like I explained before, I've got this kind of double-edged sword where I'll, you know, I'll go 200% into something. And having accountability for me is really important. Not to try and push me to do more. I don't need that. I need the opposite. I need someone to look at me and say, now is not the time to... Really? Yeah. I need someone to say, let's just, let's just hold same, 20% of the time. Are you the same in your business? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I've got a, I've got a business mentor who, who helps me a lot. And, you know, he, he often refers it to, you know, the double-edged sword as well. You know, don't, you don't need to... Take this to 200%, you know, 80% is good for now. And then when it's time, bang, you know, you, you go all out. I kind of, I kind of see it a bit like when you're in martial arts, right? When you're, you, you need, you need to be very poised and balanced, but you need to deliver a hard strike. So what I spent a lot of my time doing is trying to remove as much tension from my life as possible. So I'm so relaxed all the time. And at the, the very last minute when you strike, you clench your fist, right? And it's at that moment where you deliver tension. The tension only comes in at the very last point before you make contact. Up until that point, you're preserving energy. You're trying to be in this relaxed state. So for me, it's like not being burnt out and then having all the energy I need to do the high pressure stuff when I need to do it. And so I, I see so many parallels between entrepreneurship and business and, and martial arts for, as one example. Right? I've stopped you. Sorry. So you did the gym and then the evening you do 20 minutes of? Well, it's 30 to 45 minutes on the assault bike, but for two reasons, really. Um, do the kids like the, the assault, play the around like, you? There's a wife like I, I go to the gym for the assault tea or something. Or... Yeah, yeah. So the kids play around me. You know, I'll I'll be speaking to the kids while while I'm doing it, and you know, while I'm walking. The assault bike's a bit different. The assault bike is one of those bits of cardio kit, and this is like an '80s style assault bike. When I go to the local gym, kind of a rundown gym that I that I use for this. And it's there's the two reasons I love that assault bike are. The first thing is it burns a lot of calories, right? You can just get through, you can whiz through loads of calories in 45 minutes. The other thing is it's horrible. No one wants to do it. And so if I, if I say to myself, I'm going to do 45 minutes on an assault bike every day, I'm just forcing discipline into my life. And I think that when you force discipline into your life, you become more resilient. And I think, you know, a lot of the work you do with business owners, I'm sure is about just developing that resilience as well. Right. You know, and I, and I think, um, I think, we can't control some of the traumatic or difficult experiences we are going to go through. And you have no idea what's coming. You can just assume that it's going to be difficult. All you can do to prepare yourself for that is make sure that you've got high levels of discipline and resilience in your life, right? So for me, I try and- you come prepared. Yeah, I just try and make sure I fill my life with discipline. This is one of the main reasons I, I do the walks. I do the training. I do the assault work and stuff. Just to make sure I've always got that edge. I'm, you know, how, how intense would you rate yourself from? <laughs> 
zero being <laughs> Gandhi to Mother Teresa to 10 being like, I don't know, we, we could put out to public vote. We'll put out to public vote. How intense. I'm going to add to your wife and kids. If you ask my wife, she'll probably say, do you, do you overthink things? You have this habit of overthinking things? Yeah, very much so. This is why I like walking because you process your thoughts when you walk, right? So, you know, if I don't do that walk, then I, I'll overthink things a lot, you know, but if I, if I go on that walk, I'm in a very calm right. state. Overthinking things is a curse, right? Because you can yeah. get too much into things and you add your own story. I think, story I, I think human beings, things. human beings, we, we love to use our imagination and short term, we always, you know, imagine good and bad things happening around us. And it's like, things are rarely as good or as bad as we think they're going to be short term. But in long term, we always underestimate what, we, what can be achieved or what can't be achieved. And so I, th I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's funny how much we overthink. I've got a, I've got a more balanced approach to, to the way in which I think now. I, I think very much long term. Um, a lot of my work now with, with businesses is within philanthropy. You know, we've got a successful business now um, through the Warrior Academy and through the other businesses I do. Um, I've kind of moved now and transitioned. I'm going to come to that. To the, yeah, to the, to the kind of charity so, side. So you came, okay, let's do that. You've got, you got the schools yeah. in, uh, in the UK. Mm -hmm. And then what made you come to Dubai? So I was, I was visiting a mutual friend of ours, uh, Tim. How do you know Tim? We went to school together. Yeah. So it, was he one of the bullies? Or no? He was the bully. Yeah. Was and he? And this is my long term. No. Yeah. So, you know, he uh, turned it around. Now you're bullying him psychologically. <laughs> no, I just pick up him every go, day. He has to go yeah. on runs with you. <laughs> I hold him accountable. Have you been on the assault by today? <laughs> or Tim. <laughs> so, uh, so no, so we went to school together. Anyway, so I went to, uh, to visit Tim just for a long weekend in, in Dubai. We had such a good time and I wanted to expand how the work. How long have you got? Four years ago. 20. 19 four years. so four three years, years ago years. yeah that was 2018 i visited first i think anyway it was it was such a good trip and I, I looked around and i was like no one's doing what we are doing in the uk our whole focus is on character development what did you have in the uk at that time i had a best-selling book uh called the warrior method which basically detailed our four-step methodology for changing lives with giving children a black belt character and it was making huge transformations we had won several awards um, and so I had a team who were managing about 500 students um, in the Southwest, wanted to test it somewhere urban. It was going to be London, saw Dubai as an opportunity and then came out here. And so, um, who run, do you still have that business in England? Yeah. 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 Who runs it for you? We've got an amazing area manager called Matt, who, who essentially looks after the whole of the UK. Yeah. How did you find him? How did I find Matt? Um, recruitment when you expand, especially when dealing people's business. Yeah. Very, very do, do you know what? I mean, I, I've been through so much with Matt. It's incredible. You know, he's been with me for so many years, six years or so now. And it's, you know, I'm a very loyal guy and I really, really value loyalty. Um, so many ups and downs we've had in the business, COVID, you know, challenges with HR, with staff, with whatever. Um, and he's just, he's just shone as a really brilliant leader, not just of the team that he manages, but also of the whole community. Um, I think I got lucky finding Matt. I, I really do. You know, he's a, he's a, a dad of uh, five or six. And so he's, he's got a very much a, a father like role with our students as well. Um, and so, you know, he, he's super passionate about martial arts, super passionate about our vision and our mission. Um, and now has got a, a massive influence on the charity side of what we do, which I can go into in a bit. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think I got lucky. We kind of cross paths. He applied for a job on Facebook. It's Pretty hard to find good instructors in the countryside. They've got to be a black belt. They've got to, you know, or tick all the boxes. Whereas in Dubai, we're inundating. We've got waiting lists of world champions, you know, queuing up to work with us. And we we turn, you know, European world champions, even Olympic athletes, away because they haven't made the cut. And so it's it's you know, what's it's, your interviewing process? Our interviewing process. So some don't make the cut. What? Why? Yeah. So so it's one thing of being really a competitor and having a track record of winning trophies. But you need to have an amazing teaching background. You need to have over a decade in teaching experience. Um, and now, you know, we partner with a, a company here called Overlord Academy. So when someone goes through our six month probation, they also get taken into the wilderness where they have to take a team of 10 children uh, with Overlord Academy who are all ex British forces, uh, all trained in Sandhurst, right? So these guys then look after one of our instructors for a long weekend and give us a character assessment back. So that's you something. invest in. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so essentially this partnership works quite well because, you know, our instructor can help them during that weekend oh, and in return, they can assess their character and see what their leadership's like. 
You know, it's it's one thing being a great instructor in the dojo, but what are they like when they're, when they're doing something uncomfortable that's outside of their their comfort zone, right? So you get a report, and that's done in Dubai. Yeah, that's done in Dubai. Yeah, so we're we're actually launching that this this year. We haven't started that yet. That starts hopefully term one. We we'll do our first one. Where my kids go to your classes is that your first business on the f- in Dubai in in Dubai? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we so we then your own center. No, so we've got six offices in Dubai. We've got three in Abu Dhabi, and we're launching in Doha now as well. When you say offices, you mean actual classes going on? Yeah, so we so we basically have an office like this. We'll have six in a row, and then we basically turn them into boutique studios. So rather than having a big empty warehouse like you typically see in mm-hmm. martial arts gyms, which you know is it's really kind of daunting for a child with low confidence to walk into a big empty warehouse and have to you know suddenly do something uncomfortable like martial arts for the first time. We have these small boutique studios which we work with a, a you know an award winning interior design company called Studio New to create. And um, they're designed specifically to reduce anxiety. They're very minimalist, just like your beautiful office here, right? There's like a kind of zen, calm vibe as you walk in. And we specialize in small classes, 10 to 12 kids maximum in a class, often two instructors, um, amazing instructors who know how to build rapport, who know how to work with kids. We've all been trained in anti-bullying, character development, um, you know, additional needs, all sorts of stuff. So, so that's the process we've got, which makes us quite unique here. Um, and, and yeah, so we, we, we basically yeah, started the problem with expanding because you've got so many people looking for the problem. I, I'm, I've got out of the human side of the business. Right? Yeah. Cause I human equals headache. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in a lot of ways, I think despite having like, we have a seven step recruitment process. Yeah. Yeah. And there's still some, you know, it's, it's an, you, through you, system. if you're not the sort of person who can hack doing all the HR, you've got to find someone you can, you have. Yeah, we've got a great leadership team who, you know, I think it was me on my own. I would get really stressed out about little niggles here and there. Three. Yeah. You haven't had business that. What, yeah. How do you come out with a leadership team from? I mean, <laughs> I'm 57 and I still don't know that shit. Where did you get this? Do you study business? Do you, who took, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, something runs in, within you because your dad didn't teach you. No, I, I mean, I've, I've sought out incredible mentors around the world. Um, I've been a business coach now for a few years. So I mentor about 300 business owners a year. Um, I've, I've got a great mentor who's taught me a lot. I've done several business courses. So I've invested heavily into my own education, not the traditional route, but lots of various courses. Um, and we've got a team of 60 around the world now. Um, you know, we, in the last two years, we've gone from 30 to 60, right? And so with that comes a huge cultural shift because essentially you're moving from a lifestyle business to a performance business. And so in the last year in particular, I needed to have for the first time ever, I needed to have a, a you know a four person leadership team, someone who does all the marketing, someone who does all the HR and the operations, someone who focuses on the instructors. It's a big transition, huge transition. Yeah, yeah, and and, and you know, but what I've noticed is that is if you've got the they're right on people on in basic place, salaries. No, they, I mean, yeah, and and it's a big investment, yeah. right? And it's and it's like, whoa, you know, but then but then often you look at it and you think, if I didn't have them in place, I would have to do four jobs here. So now that you've got specific people doing specific things you now have to expand right and so in the in the last on the deliverables are you the guy who pushes them yeah so so i do a i do a check-in with our with our head of operations every two weeks then every month i do a leadership team meeting where i basically sit down with them we go through goals and that sort of stuff um do you still run classes no i I mean i don't teach i haven't taught now for several years so what do you do apart from the running machine, the bike in the gym. Yeah. So no, I just walk full time. No, I'm joking. So, so what I do is I, my, my job comes down to telling the stories about the Warrior Academy, why we exist, what we're doing, whether that's online or on stage, trying to get eyeballs onto us. Yeah, Cause you work with schools, right? We work with schools. Yeah. So sometimes we do talks in schools, but very rarely. Um, I, I, I more so do talks to, to large groups of business owners. Um, do you, do you charge for that? We, I do charge for that. Yeah. How did they find out about you? Um, I've got an, an, um, an assistant who, you know, podcasts, that sort of stuff. A lot of the time people find out about it. I've got a website, SebastianBates.com. Um, or we'll put this all in the, yeah, cool. What's on the video? That'd be good. And so, yeah, so my, 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 a lot of my work is telling stories about who we are, what we do, why we do it. Um, it's finding funding so we can expand and it's the strategy and the innovation behind what we're doing. And you're constantly looking at raising money. Yeah, I, I think that having access to deep pockets is a really important thing if you're a boss. Um, in the last eight months, I've raised about a million pounds um, without what having to take on. What business have you given away? None. But what do you need with dividends? 
No, no. So, 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 so this, the million pounds we've raised in the last year, for instance, is, is basically through loans and funding, bank loans and stuff. Okay. Not, we did and not we some crowdfunding we've done as well. As it, I'm an investor, right? So yeah. crowdfunding, uh, what's the returns? This crowdfunding, what, what, what I they? think, I think this crowdfunding platform gives like seven to 10% or something. Per annum. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, we, we are expanding into a city. I need about half a million pounds to do it. And so that's what we've done for Doha. We're about to launch into Saudi within the next 12 months as well. So, um, so that's having access to deep pockets is, is part of my job, right? So if I had to break down my job as CEO, it's tell stories, access deep pockets, um, strategy and innovation. That's pretty much it. Um, you know, the, the whole operation side, I've stepped back from now. HR, I've stepped back from now. The micro is somebody else taking care of it. Sorry, the micromanagement is somebody yeah. else. Doing yeah, yeah, that. absolutely. Now you're yeah. In the macro company. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and one of the one of the biggest things I did as well with this is it what motivates you? Money? No, I, I mean I, I think up until the point you're financially free as an entrepreneur, you you are seeking money in order I don't to. Think you'll ever be financially free. I, well, this we is always it. Always put ourselves under pressure. I shine most when I'm actually under pressure. Right, and, and the you, moment and... I got too much, I relax and I hate it. Yeah, then it's the same with you. I think that people are, I think you're a better person when you're financially free and you've, you've got enough resources around you not to be desperate for anything. Correct. You can breathe. You right. know, the business exactly. is there. You don't, you don't want to be in the edge of your seat because Correct. then you're just a highly strung mess of a and person. And that right? desperation feeling, they feel it. They never invest in you. They never work with exactly. you. Exactly. So you want to have this calm presence. Yes. And, and when, you, when, you're, when your investments kind of cover your living and you don't, you know, outlive that, it's, it's, a, it's a calm presence. And so, you know, I, th I think for me, the... One of my main motivators is, you know, I always say to business owners, have a reason beyond making money to exist, right? And so when, when you have a difficult financial year, there's something else that you're doing which lights you up. And so that's why I created the charity. So I created the Bates Foundation 12 months ago. And the idea of the Bates Foundation was to scale what we were doing locally in the UK. Where we were giving free scholarships to children who were going through really difficult times and financial hardship and chronic bullying, depression, even suicide. Uh, we, were, we were sponsoring the siblings of children who were terminally ill through that transition of their, of their sibling passing, all this sort of stuff. So what do you mean sponsor? What, what would you pay for? So we would, we would enroll them in our program, train them once or twice a week, and, be, and give support to the parents when they need it. So basically mentoring uh, through, probably through our program. Your biggest challenge was the parents, right? In a lot, in, well, in general, yeah. I mean, I mean, kids are pretty straightforward. It's it's getting the parents to lean in. That's one of the biggest challenges we've got, right? Trust you too. Yeah, I mean, trust trust us with the most important thing in their lives, and so but you would think so, right? Exactly. Yeah. Be. Yeah. Well, often, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> often, not. often is. Yeah. Often, often isn't. Um. But yeah. So so the we wanted to scale that local scholarship feeling to a global to a global state, and so I had the, had this concept of, you know, what if we could scale the Warrior Academy around the world. And within 12 months, you know, we, we did exactly that. We, we've got 2,000 children now in orphanages and slums and homeless shelters um, in rural um, countries, in, in rural areas of countries like Kenya and Nepal. Where, How do you find them? Um, we, we, try and, we try and network with other charities. One of, the, one of the biggest challenges we've got about spreading our charity around the world is a lot of orphanages are actually corrupt. That's what, that's what Robert Yeah, and you, you, and, and we our, did this in Nepal. Really? And then we realized it was just a big setup. Yeah, a lot of them are. A lot of them are. And you know, they're seeking investment from other companies. So we never, we never exchange money. So what we do is we look for a local charity who's already in an orphanage. We then visit the orphanage, assess it, see if our work would help them, see if they're aligned, see if they've got the values and ethos the same as us. Um, and then what we do is we um, look for a local instructor. And so that local instructor goes through the same interview process that we do you know, back home. And our UK area manager, Matt, then interviews them and does all their training. So they're trained pretty much online through that. Every single week, they send us videos of the training they're doing with the kids. We send uniforms to the place. So the actual establishment never sees any money. We just pay the instructor direct. I was going to say you pay a full-time salary. And so... But then he's answerable. Right. So that, delivering. The, the establishment, yes. the orphanage, the headmistress, or whatever it is, watches the instructor. We eliminate corruption by doing that, right? Mm -hmm. Um, we send 20 uniforms, we see what happens, and then we send the other 500 uniforms, right? Because the other thing is this, you send a uniform to an orphanage in, in, you know, in, in Kenya, you may never see the uniform again, you know, it could be sold or whatever it is. And so, you know, you, you, you can't blame them for that. 
um, especially some of the some of the conditions that a lot of the places are branding. You'll be all over Kenya. Yeah, yeah, well, we are yeah. now. I mean, your, we, your students will be using it. But every street corner, <laughs> at every true. airport bus stop, they've all got your maybe yeah. Warrior Academy tops on. <laughs> and so, um, and so, do you, know, do you know how we got to hear about you? How we were in. Uh, uh, What's You're walking called? down the road in Kenya, no, and you saw. No, saw no, see, yeah, it was the borders of Nigeria and Kenya. No, where was it? It was um, that place where we had breakfast on the ground floor. What's that called? Thomas Surge. Thomas Surge. Yeah. And then lots of kids walk around with your top. Hundred kids walking with a warrior yeah. top. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, hang on a second. Where is this guy? Oh, upstairs. Yeah. Man. That's how we came. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's it's funny that that I think we give a lot of business that to the to the shop downstairs. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so that's that's the charity side of what we do. So, so the goal there was for every paying member of the War Academy, which you've got about 2,000 students, within three to five years, we wanted one student on a scholarship. But we've done that within 12 months. We've now got 2,000 paying and 2,000 on a scholarship. So our goal over the next 18 months is to be on every single populated continent. And so we're, we're now starting clubs in the favelas of Brazil, in the Philippines, in Tunisia, in Malawi. Um, we're starting Who's clubs in India, Sri Lanka. Who's managing them? Um, the, so we've got, my, my dad is the, the operations manager of the Bates Foundation. He's left the army air force. So he left the army, was the regional director of one of the UK's largest army charities. Oh, and I had had him to then join this one. And so I pretty much just. He's on your payroll. Yeah. So I, payroll. yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. God. So, so, um, I've kind of just self-funded this as like a passion project. We're not an established charity in the UE, so we can't fundraise anyway. We're in the process of doing it in the UK. So I basically just created the charity out of my own savings. Um, I spend more on the charity than I do on living myself. And so for me, it's, it's building that kind of 100 year legacy of what we can actually do in the world with character development as the base. What would these kids then go off and do? And how can we then support them further through education and then sponsor maybe the, you know, the, the kind of ventures they then go on to do. So um, it's a really exciting time. Aren't we doing some sponsorship of you today? Sponsor today? Telling me, uh, I'm writing a check today, aren't I? Are you? I think so. Angela was on about, let's have a photograph. You're writing a check. Cool. Me. I'm up for that. Let's do that. Do, do, okay. I, get to, do, do I get to choose what's on it? I said, do I get these huge checks? And, it's like, like, <laughs> and you have to pretend it's got loads of notes and it's just, I don't know. No one, no one told me about that. She's coming but... over to say hello anyway. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> She's like, you're writing a check today. Like, okay, how much? I don't know. <laughs> so what's the average um, contribution? For the Bates Foundation? Um, it costs us very little to, to start a club, you know, with a hundred kids, it'd be basically pay a full-time salary to an instructor. Uh, that can, you know, that can vary massively depending on which country we go. But people are paying to your charity. Not yet. No, oh, we've had, I'll we've had the, a couple, I'll be a couple the first. Of, yeah. Oh, amazing. We've had a couple of one-off donations. Can you but... give my wife a call? <laughs> <laughs> had a couple of one-off donations, but we've never had, um, we don't, we don't have any sort of ongoing fundraising yeah we're, we're in the that, process of doing that out of your own pocket it's just me yeah your own just me yeah so how much does it cost to set a center up um to set a center up yeah i mean we've got we've got a school in the in in nairobi for instance which is about 800 students it might cost us a couple of thousand pounds to fit out uniforms over there um maybe sort of ten thousand pounds per year for an instructor to train there to train them up and everything and then you've got 800 kids going through the program what's really cool about this is you know, by February, 2024, we've, at the moment, we've got about 4,000 kids around the world in five countries training with us. In February, that should double, but we are going to be hosting the first Warrior Academy World Championships here in the UAE, but we're going to be flying students in from Kenya, from Nepal, and from India, from the UK, and also from the UAE to compete here. So we've got kids, you know, in the, in the foothills of the Himalayas who have never left the village and we're buying them passports, making sure there's a carer to go with them to compete in a world championships in Dubai, all sponsored by the Bates Foundation. And I think things like that, just A, it is an incredible thing for this child to experience and to look back on. But the rest of the community then see what we're doing and then value what we're doing more and then want to be behind it more and then more children get to go through that. So, um, so we're really excited about that. That's the next kind of can, big I, event. I've got a vision. Oh yeah. I can see my gladiators fighting your warriors. Oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should do. Can I sponsor you? Yeah. yeah. Let's discuss that. Yeah, that'd be amazing. Yeah, we have little gladiator masteries going on all over the place. Oh, really? Interesting. No, and there's nothing going on. I, I want to work with you. Oh, cool. I've just sponsored the Dubai Squash Limit. Okay. So um, we've got an interactive training. It's all business and money and sales mm. and marketing. 
Uh, but Angela, as you know, she's just a junior gladiator. Yeah, yeah. Some financial really research. looking forward to, to learning more about that. I think that's so needed. You know, so few kids have a grasp of finances. We're never taught it, right? If, if anything, we're taught not to talk about it. Exactly. You know? Like a taboo subject like religion or politics yeah. and stuff. So just one final question, because we've been an hour and 10 minutes. Can you oh, believe really? it? <laughs> I tell you, you'll go quick. <laughs> we have covered like 90% of the stuff I want to cover. Um, are you still personally, are you still, are you competing physically? Are you just keeping on top of your health and your... Yeah, so I go, I go through stages. I, I, I was, last year I was doing, I was training quite a lot in jiu-jitsu and I was going to compete again, but I, I kept getting injuries every single week. So I'm just stepping back for a year or two and just, just building up my body and building up the strength and, and, you know, through the walking and that sort of stuff. Will I compete again? Yes, I'm sure I will. Uh, most likely in jiu-jitsu. I think stand-up fighting is probably out for me now. Um, you know, the, the shin on shin, knee on knee type action from Muay Thai has a, has a shelf life, uh, for someone who's had various injuries. So I, I think it's more likely going to be jitsu. How do you go back? Do you follow UFC? Not really. I, 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 I saw that McGregor broke his leg. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think is going to happen? I don't really know. You're you know, about coming back, but are you going to kick again when he's just had your legs snapped in half? Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it, have you seen his documentary? No, there's a, I think it's a three or four part documentary, which is which is quite interesting. Um, I'm just always a bit disappointed. Whenever I look at UFC stars, I, they've got this opportunity, right, to to really inspire so many young people, and then they use it to to kind of gloat and and, and show off. Him. And I met him. Be to, even you know do criminal activity like like McGregor, you're getting arrested, and it's yeah. just like it's unnecessary. Oh, you met him, do you? Probably a totally, totally different guy, in real life, or totally different. Yeah, guy. classic. So giving, so loving, so amazing. Yeah, yeah. He gave us time. It was my son's 21st birthday. I'm sure he's just and playing the game, though. He's and, playing the game. You know, he knows exactly how to do it. But th this is the problem, right? When there's money the behind masses it. think that's the norm. Exactly. Uh, he recently kicked some mascot's face in or something. Oh, yeah. Him out. I think I saw a video of that. Yeah. Deep yeah. He actually hit him. I, I thought it was pretense, but yeah. yeah. And when he was down, he was, hit, he was about to hit him again. I don't understand yeah. why. Yeah. He was a bit tipsy. He wants to get on the get on the TV and it, it's obviously working. Yeah, really. yeah, the whole world. Yeah. Where are you going with your business over the next twelve? We're going to speak this time over the next twelve, 12 months. So if I speak to you again in twelve months, we would have launched in Doha, probably launched in Saudi as well, and the charity. You, mean you have to travel to launch it there. Yeah, I've just come back from Doha actually, so we've we've, we've literally just decided on a location, beautiful location, amazing, amazing spot right in the center, um, and we've already got. 12 instructors who have applied for a position. I noticed there's no doubt. In you. Yeah. There's no doubt. You know it's going to work. I, over, I overthink things a lot, right? So I've already, I mean, I've, I've got a rule in my business, which I call no surprises. I've already planned for the best and the worst case for everything. And like I said, short term, we, it's really as good or as bad as we think, right? So for me, I'm, I'm very, it takes a lot to surprise me. You know, I'm not surprised by people because I've already imagined the worst and best case scenario of the outcomes of the people in my life and the situations, the, when you take a risk, you know, I think base jumping really taught me to do so much due diligence and really analyze risks so that there are no shocks or surprises with that. Um, I, I'm pretty confident on our numbers. We're, we're a very predictable business as well. We're very data led. We've won awards for how we use data. Um, we beat Carrefour and a few other public listed companies in a, in a customer insights, Gulf customer service awards in 2023 for the way in which we use data. So it's, we, we, we act like a big business, even though we're a small business. And so that makes everything we're doing a very predictable. Measure every. Yeah, I know we are in 10 years based on what we're doing now. Where did you get disappointed most? Where do I get disappointed most? That's a great question. I think I get disappointed most if I don't live up to the things that I expect of myself. I'm, I'm rarely disappointed about other people because I know I can't control that. But if I, if I don't do something that's within my control, and don't live up to what I would expect myself to do because I've got high standards, then I would find that disappointing. I get disappointed. Thank you for that. I get disappointed when people don't live up to their, to their potential. Right. Yeah, yeah. It hurts me so because I care. Yeah. And I see that they could and they just don't. Yeah. It's disheartening to see, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Nothing. You could have had it all. You got this, you got that, but you just don't, don't want to. Yeah. You don't want to go out there and work or you're lazy. And you, and you can help that person as much as you can. You know, you can lead a, a horse and water. Go but... go go right? Yeah. So the internal yeah. dialogue is constantly knocking themselves in limited beliefs. That hurts me. And that's why I'm not going out there so much anymore. Right. Because I get disappointed. They pay a fortune to come to my courses. Yeah. And they don't even pick up the book afterwards. Yeah. 
It just couldn't. I think. I think always done. No surprises, right? Like if you look at the data, there'll be there'll be twenty five percent of all your students don't do it. I've got yeah. a friend who runs an incredible course in finances, and people pay thousand pounds or five thousand pounds to do it. Twenty percent don't even finish it or don't even start it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's incredible. A lot of people just buy stuff because they think it makes them feel better. Yes. But you, the, on the, the flip you're side, you'll have the top twenty percent, right? You're, you're absolutely smashing. You're it. absolutely right. I still hurt. You know, yeah. I just think uh, people are numbers. People are. I care about that person. Yeah. I know he falls in the twenty-five percent category, but you I see think, something in him yes. which he hasn't yes. seen. Yes. Yeah. Because I started it all because I my love for people. Yeah. Unlived potential, mm. just a waste. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know, in time, they're going to regret it. Yeah. yeah. Really be too late. Very true. Man, it's an absolute honor meeting you. You too. We should have done this years because yeah. maybe I would have called Tim <laughs> by mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Tim could have been sat here. We do look alike. I honor you very, very much. I salute you, my friend. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I have. Thank you. And see you again.